The first thing uh, I'd like to say is, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here today. And I've been absolutely astounded by the, the depth, range, and diversity uh, of the subject matter. Uh, excellently presented as well. Uh, they say that um, an expert is a man from out of town with PowerPoint. Well, I'm not an expert, so I have no PowerPoint. <laughs> the question I would ask, first of all, is, and you probably want to know this as well, it's who am I? Um, it's the sort of question that you ask yourself when you wake up at night, isn't it? It's a sort of semi-philosophical question. But uh, I'm, in fact, a surgeon, a cardiothoracic surgeon, and uh, I'm also an occupational physician. I have uh, worked in uh, West Africa, um, the Middle East, and Far East. Uh, I represent today the Hamish Ogston Foundation. It's a relatively new foundation uh, which specializes in heritage, music, and in health. Now, we have pledged uh, more than three million to antivenom trials in India, Vietnam, uh, and Myanmar. We're also interested in education. I think unless you look after the very excellent young people, uh, then the future is not assured, but it's our responsibility to look after them. So what we're also doing is we're trying to, to put together some funding for, for young scientists, and I think that would be a very good investment for us. Now, I have to stick to the text, otherwise uh, David will be a little upset with me. Um, this is my question. What on earth inspired a foundation like the Hamish Ogston Foundation? I've known Hamish for 50 years. What inspired us to take an interest in snakebite? Uh, I think it was largely when we looked at the very impoverished agricultural workers uh, who were losing their breadwinners. Um, I think it was also seeing David Williams in shorts and an Aussie bush hat uh, tramping around Australia. Uh, and it was his film, The. Uh, I, I think it was Waiting to Die. That was uh, Minute, minutes, to min minutes to Die. That was excellent. And of course, the big factor, of course, is the silvery nature of David Worrell's tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to think of something. Think back to your earliest perceptions of the snake. Uh, I, I was thinking about my early perceptions, and I, my earliest perception was really, when Christmas came round, there were also readings from the good book and Genesis. And I was quite enthralled by the, um, the way that Eve uh, was tempted to eat the, uh, the forbidden, forbidden fruit. And she said, it was the serpent that beguiled me and I did eat. Well, God got pretty cross and he said to the serpent, you know, you're damned above all cattle. You, on your belly shalt you go and dust shalt you eat. So this is the sort of image of the serpent that you grew up with. Uh, I remember that uh, the word snake was often used as an insult. I remember my mother calling my father a snake. And it was, <laughs> it was accompanied by a lot of hissing as well. So I do remember it. It only happened once. <laughs> Um, we played snakes and ladders. And the perception was, you know, that you go up the ladder and you come slithering down the snake. I mean, it's slightly unfortunate for the poor serpent. Um, then as you got a bit older, you, you got into things like Shakespeare. And there's that lovely line in Macbeth when Lady Macbeth is chastising Macbeth for not having the guts to do away with Duncan. And she says, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Um, but I don't think we can, can quite leave it there, because I think that what surprised me is that I think mean, successful businesses and research teams have something in common, and that we test assumptions and traditional ways of thinking. Um, I found at least 60 business logos which featured the snake, which quite surprised me. So obviously there are characteristics of the snake which businesses want to strengthen their logo. Um, we're all familiar with the, um, the rod of Asclepius. I mean, you've only really got to look at the WHO logo to see it there. So just about every um, health organization usually features this rod and the snake. If you look back at 
things like your early days of Rudyard Kipling and Mowgli. I mean, Mowgli was the, a man-child, and he was looked after by the snake. The snake was quite a benign creature. But the funny thing was, or the odd thing was, when they came to make a film of it, they said, no, 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 no. You can't portray the snake in a benign light. He's got to be villainous. Uh, so I find that, that quite interesting. And I've looked at some children's literature as well to see what they do. And I think the metropolitan elite has been at work because we can, there are children's books um, called Jake the Snake, Sebastian the Serpent, and the Snake that was afraid of people. It's quite interesting that you know, these are the sort of things now that are, are being churned out to influence children, where I was left with the book of Genesis, and on my belly shalt they go. I mean, things have changed, I think. Then there are also those surprising people who, although they don't like snakes very much, um, covet snakeskin shoes. I don't think anybody's wearing them here. Uh, and snakeskin belts, etc., etc. So now we are actually regarding the snake for its diversity, its evolutionary efficiency, stealth, strength, tenacity, and guile. In fact, these are all human qualities that we quite aspire to, aren't they? Um, so my own observations as a non-snake bite expert is that I look at the snake and I see many things in the snake. And I know today we've, we've looked at venoms uh, in many ways, but I look at the snake as so much about its musculoskeletal system to be worked out. You've got the skin, the camouflage, the shedding, the digestion. I mean, the other day I was watching an anaconda uh, swallow a large capybara. Uh, it's amazing how it digests that. And also it, it, its sensory modalities as well, and how it actually manages to, to smell and detect uh, vibration. And also I was interested in Jose Maria Gutierrez's... Is, um, it's paper on snake bite and venoming, and it has 160 references, which to me shows the depth of the subject. Um, so I think if you need innovation, which is the other thing we have to, you've got to have a fair sprinkling of uh, inspiration and imagination. And I have the feeling that snake bite research, uh, looked at from a very different angle that you do, um, and I think the probably current examples will be very, very fertile territory for discoveries which can be applied to other areas. Um, if you look at the discovery of things like penicillin, digitalis, uh, quinine, and sildenafil, uh, what can be more exciting, if you get my meaning, Vicar? Um, but there is another aspect to discovery, which is what we call serendipity. Um, I think most of you will be probably be familiar with that. But what, I mean, serendipity, as interesting as it came from a book written by Horace Walpole in the mid-18th century. And it was called, to give it its title, Three Princes of Serendip, Chance and the Prepared Mind. So what happened was that the king educated his three princes, the three sons, and sent them out uh, into the world once he was satisfied that they'd been well-educated. And that all sorts of stories about what they did and what they tripped over and what they managed to see. And it wasn't because it was a completely fortuitous. It was because they had minds that were prepared to pick these things up. So in fact, you can you know, go into the station on the right train, but finish up at the wrong platform. So what you've always got to be doing is looking left, looking right, and thinking, is something happening here that we're missing? And I just feel that snake bite science has got a lot of that in it. Now, I should actually uh, tell you a little bit about the position of the private donors. Um, I can only speak for my own organization. Um, we come in many shapes and sizes of private donors. Um, I think the most important thing for us is to enjoy what we're doing and have fun. We like to have fun. Uh, we make no apologies for that. We tend to gravitate toward niche areas because we know we can't compete, not that we'd want to, with the large donors. So we like to find our little, little areas that we can actually make some, some difference. Um, we like to think of ourselves as enablers, not a posse of panjandrums that comes over the horizon and takes over and tells everybody what to do and how to do it. I mean, we all know that if you try that approach, 
you're dead in the water fairly quickly. The other thing we don't do is that we don't hand out a large check uh, and then disappear stage left, leaving the scientists to ascend to their sunlit uplands. We actually quite like to be involved in managing a project. Uh, not micromanaging, but we like to see the whole thing mapped out so that tranches of money can be given when targets uh, and goals have been reached. Um, obviously, outcomes are very important because we, we, we need to make sure that what we're doing there's a certain cost-effectiveness in it. Now, outcomes are very difficult things, but we have to have those. Um, we also like to share our business successes and failures. Um, I think that's particularly important. And also, to look for where we can gain leverage from an entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, there are many examples of this when you're in trying to distribute venom around the world. You know, how are we going to do this? I mean, my own experience in, in Africa was that if I really wanted something done, I went to the women's groups. They had a very good business sense. They knew how to do things. So a lot of the successes that we, we had where I was were through the women's groups, which I'm sure many of you would be glad to know, others maybe not. Uh, we also have uh, a system of due diligence. Uh, we make no apologies for actually looking very closely at the organizations that ask us for money. Uh, everybody does that. But we have to make sure that these people have a track record. Are they going to waste money? Who's in charge, etc.? Which brings me on to my sort of final point, is that I know a lot of people who worked extremely hard, and we went to Geneva earlier this year, and there was a, a really excellent WHO document, the roadmap, a lot is going on there. It's very ambitious. But the thing that we would like to feel comfortable about is that we know what's going on. We, don't, we need to make sure that somebody controls it, somebody has a responsibility, somebody's accountable. If you don't do that, and if you don't run a project like that, and it's got to be fairly ruthless, and it goes in all sorts of different directions, and you miss your targets, and nobody knows what the hell's going on. So I think there's got to be some fairly tight management, and we would like uh, to have that, because then we would then know where to put our money and put our interests. But if we don't have that, it's going to be very difficult. Now, I know it's early days, and you're really working on this, and I'm sure it'll happen. But um, that, I think, is probably all I have said at the moment, in case you want to ask some questions. Actually, I congratulate you, because at this time of night, most people have made for the hills. But, you know, I, it's pretty good. I'd also like to come back and say, we have our first fellow, Tom Lamb, who's here. Tom? Uh, Tom is going to go out to um, Myanmar as the Hamish Ogston Fellow. He's our first fellow. And he'll be there for three, <coughs> pardon me, three years or more. Uh, and we're very excited about it. And I think, I hope Tom is as well. Uh, and we hope that there will be others to follow as well. Um, because I, I come back to saying that I think that we, we hear a lot about what's going on in Snakebite. And our feeling is that you've, you've now got to look to the next generation. Because, OK, you might hit your targets. But unless there are people coming up and are attracted into this, now that it's got uh, some support from the Welcome and Diffid, I think it could, you don't want it to die a death. It needs impetus. And the, the young, keen people in the laboratories, and I keep hearing good stories about them, really need to be looked after. Right, thank you. Thank you, Michael. And, and did you want to say that if anyone's interested in more information about approaching HOF, yes. uh, there's a website? There is a website, HOF website. Um, there's information there about how you go about... Uh, applying for a grant, um, and also what our basic philosophy is. I mean, the philosophy has changed, and, but that's our position at the moment. Um, so we're finding it very exciting. Good. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.